then who talked to you about that? Um, so Ryan always uh, we recorded that. Okay. Do you still want to do that for <laughs> prosperity? Because he just did it in case he needed it for some other time. Yeah, we okay. we yeah. didn't, and then we did, and then we didn't, and then we did. So I think that's a preference. You guys. Well, thank you for all your help. Um, I'm going to tell you 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 i am 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 going to tell you i am
that's all we do. Oh, it's Associate Professor in the Department of Epidemiology, Interim Chair of Epidemiology, and also um, one of the Associate Directors of this training program. Um, so thank you for coming today. Uh, I'm going to be talking about directed acyclic graphs, what they are, and how they can help with your research. So when we think about outcomes research, a lot of what we're trying to do is to identify why some people get sick and others don't, to identify why some people who are sick have bad outcomes and others don't, and to identify interventions and systems that prevent people from getting sick or from having bad outcomes once they have become sick. Um, one of the challenges is that a lot of times we're not doing experiments, right? A lot of times we're doing observational research where, as investigators, we don't get to control who gets which exposure, right? People are, are people or groups are getting exposed or getting the intervention in ways that might be related to their outcome. Right. So that's sort of one of the major challenges for doing the types of research that we do, doing observational research. We are worried about bias, right? and we're worried in particular that correlation does not equal causation. Right? So this is, this is something you hear in the news a lot. Um, and one of the things that we really need to think hard about is that how, do we, how do we get to the point where we think our correlations, the, the associations that we observe, are telling us something about cause and effect. So one of the tools that we can use are direct, directed acyclic graphs, or, or DAGs, right? So directed acyclic graph is a little bit of a mouthful. And so these are graphs, um, which is probably fairly obvious in the title, that consist of nodes, which are letters or words. If you see like the really formal um, treatment of this, you're going to see it as letters. You know, words are not wrong. And then edges, which are the arrows that connect to these. Um, so what are they? There are, um, you know, if you talk to some epidemiologists, <coughs> they're sort of like, oh yes, we invented these, which is not actually the truth. Um, they are actually, have been borrowed into epidemiology and other types of observational research from other fields. Um, so they're a fundamental data structure in computer science. They're, they are visual representations of Markov models. So if, you, um, if you're familiar with those, you know, these, there, there is a lot of math behind this. And um, the use that I'm going to be talking about today is the one that I think is most useful for most of the kinds of research that we do. And in this case, it's a tool for representing knowledge and assumptions and for trying to figure out where bias might be creeping into your study. I should say, um, stop me if you have any questions and so I don't get going too fast and I don't want to lose people. Okay. So um, here's an example. So this was a paper in JAMA that came out in 2006. Um, and they were trying to figure out whether ski helmets reduce the risk of head injury. Right. So one of the things, um, so uh, these investigators basically sat at the bottom of the ski slope um, and figured out you know, who's coming down with an injury. And then also recruiting um, controls from that same ski slope, same time. One of the things they were worried about was this potential um, confounding effect of age. Right? So they're not randomizing people to use a ski helmet or not. What they have is they have, um, you know, they're, they're just looking to see what people are doing. 
And younger people, so kids, are more likely to wear ski helmets than adults, at least in this particular population. That's not a biological relationship, right? That's just sort of a, a, the practice that they're observing. And kids are less likely to get head injuries than adults, right? So, so part of any association you might see could be actually between ski helmet use and head injury. If you're not careful, you could be partially seeing the effect of age, right, when you look at this association. And so if we sort of make this a little more formal, we can call age L here, um, ski helmet use, so your exposure A, and that head injury is Y. Right? So this is, this is an example of a DAG. Right? And we've got, so these are our nodes, L, A, and Y, and then the arrows represent relationships between them. So, you know, if you're an epidemiologist and you say, okay, yeah, we've, we've got this potential confounder age, so we adjust for it, right? So we put a box around it. Um, and this box can be, um, you know, any number of the sort of analytic tools that we use to adjust for age. So what about things that we don't measure, right? So the investigators can do a pretty good job of measuring age, right? Um, but you've also got this sort of risk-taking temperament, right? So people who are willing to take a lot of risks are probably more likely to get head injuries, and they're probably less likely to um, wear ski helmets. Right? So how do you measure risk-taking temperament? So there are probably some psychometric scales that you can use. Um, but the problem is, right, you're, they're recruiting people after they've gotten their head injury. So that, so some of them, um, some of them have serious head injuries, right, so they're not conscious. Other of them, right, so you can imagine having just had um, an injury, it might change the way that you answer that question, right? So this is something that's out there, and they're worried about, and they talk about in the paper, but it's not really something that they can measure. <clears throat> Right? But it's still there, right? So it doesn't change that potential confounding problem. And so we've got, you know, this U that we've added here. Right? So we have some things that we can measure, and that, and we can adjust for some things that we can't measure, and that, you know, are, are we need, but we still need to think about the potential for bias from. It. So to circle back. Um, Directed, so if you think about directed acyclic graphs, right, they're directed, which means that the arrow points from one variable to the other, right? There's no double-headed arrows here. Um, this means you can't be agnostic. You can't say, well, I think maybe this one affects that one, or maybe it's the vice versa, right? You have to, you have to make a decision about which one you think, which direction you think causality goes. And they're acyclic, which means that following the arrows, it's not possible to wind up where you start, right? So people will sometimes use diagrams like this, Right? So this one, you've got the bidirectional arrow. This one, you have sort of a feedback loop. Neither of those are actually dead. Right? They might be useful diagrams, but they're, they're not directed acyclic graphs. There are sort of different flavors that you, for different uses. Um, what, what I'm going to be talking about is the causal decks, right? And, and because I think that these are most useful in observational research. So what is a causal DAG? Um, so it means that the arrow represents a causal association, right? There, there's a, this thing causes that thing. And that you've got all of the common causes. So if you're looking at exposure and an outcome, that you have in some way represented all of the common causes of that exposure and that outcome. So you know, from an epidemiologist's perspective, it means you've got all of the confounders there. Right. Or, you know, you, you don't necessarily have to write out each one. You can sort of say L equals a whole bunch of different stuff. And no arrow means no causal effect. Questions? So, a um, couple of examples, right? So if we've got um, this complement factor H gene um, causing macular degeneration, Age is the, is the major risk factor for macular degeneration, right? It's a, it's a disease of aging. Um, but complement factor, this um, you know, variant in, in complement factor H gene that's been associated with macular degeneration doesn't really have anything to do with age, right? It's something that people are born with. It doesn't affect life expectancy. 
So there's no relationship between age and complement factor HG, right? So if we're interested in this relationship between the gene and macular degeneration, we don't actually need age on this deck, right? Because age is not a common cause of the exposure we're interested in, the gene, and the disease macular degeneration. So we can, we can take it away if we want. On the other hand, if we're looking at um, the relationship between blood pressure and coronary heart disease, we need age on this deck because age is a major risk factor for coronary heart disease, and um, age is a major risk factor for blood pressure increasing, right? So pe as people age, the blood pressure, the systolic at least, tends to increase. Um, so, you know, that is, so we need age on this deck, right? Because it is a common cause of our exposure, blood pressure, and our outcome, coronary heart disease. Um, so, you know, we have to have the common causes, even if they're unmeasured or not measurable, right? So if we're thinking about adherence to antihypertensive medication and cardiovascular disease, right, it makes sense that um, preventive medications are only going to work if people actually take them and take them in the way that they're, you know, intended to be taken. However, you know, you can imagine that people who take their medicines on time are also, you know, doing a lot of other stuff that probably, you know, they have this healthy lifestyle, and that probably is also, you know, it's not that the, and, and that's going, you know, this direction, from healthy lifestyle to antihypertensive medication adherence, right? Just taking your meds doesn't make you have, have a healthy lifestyle. Um, and it's probably also influencing your risk of cardiovascular disease, right? So even though this isn't really measured or measurable approximately, um, it needs to stay on that DAG. We can sometimes use sort of proxies to try and get at this. So things like, okay, we're interested in your antihypertensive medication adherence, but we can also look at your, say, statin adherence, right? So if people are taking both, we get, you know, that sort of at least trying to reduce the bias from that healthy lifestyle, or sort of indirectly measuring healthy lifestyle. So again, we have this, our exposure of medication adherence, outcome of cardiovascular disease, and this unmeasured thing of healthy lifestyle. So if you think about sort of walking through, how do we build up a DAG? Um, so one of the questions that I got to work on is being sort of distractible, I'm mostly a cardiovascular disease epidemiologist, but um, I got a call saying, can you help us with this Cirque du Soleil project we're working on? And I said, oh yes, that sounds like a lot of fun. Um, so, uh, we were looking at whether time off prevented injuries in circus performers. So the background for this, um, my postdoc mentor went to medical school with the medical director of Cirque du Soleil. Um, and there was this argument going on. So Cirque du Soleil, um, a lot of the, it's based in Montreal. Um, a lot of the performers and a lot of the coaches are from Eastern Europe. So there was this debate going on between the people from Eastern Europe and the people from North America. The people from Eastern Europe were saying it is very important that people practice every single day. If you don't practice every single day, um, you know, your time is off and people are going to get hurt. Whereas the people from North America were saying, no, if you practice every day, people are going to sort of develop fatigue over time. You got to have breaks because people are going to, um, you know, get injured if so, so that was that was the background for this. So Cirque du Soleil, um, you have a bunch of different roles, right? So this guy is the clown here. Um, this guy is riding upside down on a unicycle on a slack line, and these people are um, contortionists, right? So you've got for these different people. There's also musicians who are part of the troupe, right? So there are these. You can imagine that the guy riding upside down on a, on a unicycle on a slack line is probably a lot more likely to get injured than. Um, you know, the people the, the cloud. So here's our question, right? This arrow or this um, question mark here is um, not actually formally part of a DAG, but I think it can be useful just to sort of keep your focus because once you start getting a lot of arrows and a lot of nodes, keep the focus on what we're really interested in here is our exposure of time off and our outcome of injury. Now you can say, okay, the role in this troop is clearly um, a major cause of injury, right? 
people who are doing these crazy um, stunts are oh, very likely to get injured. People who are, you know, playing clarinet in the orchestra, less likely to get injured. However, this is a truth, right? So everybody gets the same days off, right? So you're, you're on or off, and it's not, that is not really related to our exposure of time off. So we can take that away. On the other hand, um, we do have this on tour variable, right? So performers get less time off when they're on tour, right? They basically get one day a week off, um, most weeks. Every once in a while, they'll get a little bit more time off. Um, and they get, so, right, so there's this relationship between on tour and having days off. Um, but they get more on injuries when they're not on tour because when they're not on tour, they're working on their new routines. Right? So people um, are, are doing things that they haven't necessarily practiced a lot. So we have to have this in our deck, right? Because this is a common cause of our outcome and exposure, unlike the role, which is a cause of our outcome, but not our exposure. So if you think about what's driving this question, um, we have this you know, potential factor of reduced fatigue, right? So that's the idea that maybe time off is gonna reduce fatigue and that's gonna reduce injury. Right? So is this a common cause of our exposure and our outcome? No, right? So this is not a common cause. This is on the pathway, right? It's, it, we don't need it in our causal deck because it's not a cause. Uh, it's not a common cause of time off and injury. Right? It's a, it's an outcome. It's essentially downstream of time off. And a lot of times there's more than one appropriate causal deck, right? So you know we need on tour that that's you know required to make this a causal deck. But we can, if we want to sort of expand this out and sort of elaborate on this DAG, we can have things in here like um, the role, maybe um, uh, because we think it's an important cause of injury. So we, we can have this in here, even though it is not a common cause. And then we can have this sort of pathway variable, this reduced fatigue variable. And both of these are appropriate. So what if you don't know? So a lot of times, you know, you're looking at these factors and you don't know whether one thing causes the other, right? And you have to make an assumption, right? So, so there's no getting around it. And one of the things that DAGs do is they make you sit down and make these assumptions, right? Because every time you run an analysis, you're making assumptions, right? So it's not like um, drawing the DAG um, is, is sort of the cause. Assumption. Every analysis has embedded assumptions in it about the way the world works, right? And it's very easy if you're not, if you're just sort of putting variables in a model, not to think, um, you know, not to really think through. Do I think, you know, that healthy lifestyle causes um, adherence, or do I think that, maybe, or you know, do I think that time off causes fatigue, or vice versa, right? So this makes you sit down and, and say, okay, this is. This is the way I think the world works. And so it can help you sort of make these assumptions explicit. Um, so people will often sort of resist that, but the truth is, if you're running any sort of model, if you're doing any sort of analysis, you are making these assumptions, whether you know you, know you are or not. So um, you can also think about, you know, as a sensitivity analysis, you could draw, say, okay, here's my, here's my best guess at the way the world works. This is the DAG that I'm going to work on as my primary analysis. And then as a sensitivity, you can say, well, if it's actually flipped, you know, you can think about how, how would you do that analysis if, you know, you, you don't know whether, say, inflammation causes kidney disease or kidney disease causes inflammation, right? So um, those sorts of, of questions you might have. So there are a lot of conventions that go along with this. Um, and, and so these are just sort of things that you'll see, but they're not necessarily key to how, how these um, work. So generally, time flows from left to right. Um, exposure is denoted by A or E. Okay, so E would be exposure, pretty straightforward. 
A, as far as, um, from what I understand, comes from a lot of this work was done it, using early um, HIV trials that had gotten completely, the, the randomization had gotten completely messed up. Like there was just all kinds of craziness going on with this trial. Um, and so this would be AZT, and it just kind of stuck. Um, the outcome divided by Y, right? So this is like your, you when know, you're modeling things, a lot of things, stats, this is usually your outcome, is, is denoted by Y. And then, or D for disease. Other measured variables will usually get called L, and I think this is lifestyle from those AZT trials, and um, or C for confounder. And then unmeasured U. But those are arbitrary. So one of the, um, the sort of terms of art that gets used when we, people start talking about DAGs is backdoor paths. <laughs> so a backdoor path is a connection between the exposure, and in this case it's A, and the outcome in, that's Y that does not follow the direction of the arrows. Right? So if we go from, so, um, I'll use the pointer so people online can hopefully see. Um, so, you know, if we think about looking at the relationship between A and Y, right, we're A to L to Y is not following that direction of the arrows, but it is a connection between A and Y. And similarly here, A, Y, right, this is the relationship we're interested in, but if we can go from A to L to Y this way, not following the directions of the arrows. However, you know, when L is on that pathway, that's not a backdoor path, that's a direct path. Distinction between those clear? Okay. So sorry, there's a lot of jargon that goes along with this and I've tried to tone it down, but um, people tend to use a lot of you know, if you start reading the papers that use this, there's, there's a ton of jargon. Um, so a path is open or active if it does not go through a variable with head-to-head -head arrows. Okay, so that means that this is an open path, right? So this is sort of our classic setup for confounding. We have a confounder being a common cause of our exposure and our outcome. Okay. So the path from A to L to Y is open in this case. Right, so this is an uncontrolled confound. In this case, right, we have L being downstream of our outcome and our exposure. Right, so this is L is a result of our outcome and our exposure. And so in that case, we have arrows that are two arrows pointing into that, and that's called a collider. And so if we have a collider and we don't do anything, we actually don't get bias, right? Because that pathway is blocked by that collider. And I've got some examples, so if this is seeming like a little abstract, but there's some more examples coming up. Um, okay, so when there's an open backdoor path, the association between the exposure and the outcome does not equal the causal effect of the exposure of the outcome, right? So, that, so an open door backdoor path is bias. Right, so this is sort of where where these graphs can start helping you, right? So you think about, okay, there is um, there's this variable, there's a pathway between my exposure and my outcome that is not that causal pathway, right? It's something else, it's some sort of something extraneous. So we can condition on a variable, right? So we can um, adjust for it, we can stratify it. On, stratify on it, we can strip, restrict, you know, so just say, you know, just men, just women, just people under the age of six, right? Um, or we can model. In this sort of DAG universe, it's represented by drawing a box around that variable, right? So this is like, you know, in our um, ski helmet example, we said age is a confounder, you know, at, we, we adjust for age, right? That's that's something that we can do. Um, and that would be represented by drawing a box around age or around the, you know, the letter that we're using to represent the age. So generally, um, you know, if, if it's a confounder, that's usually a good thing to do. However, there are times when it can actually cause problems, right? 
So conditioning on a variable on an open backdoor path removes the non-causal association, right? So we're controlling for confounding here by adjusting for age in this case. <coughs> However, if we adjust on, or if we adjust for a condition on a collider, now we're inducing bias, right? So if we're adjusting for something that's downstream of our exposure and our outcome, we have now caused bias. And that one is a little bit of a brain twister. So this is probably the best um, sort of uh, explanation I found of this. Um, and it's, this is the link. Uh, the article is called When Correlation is Not Causation, but Something Much More Scurvy. Right? <laughs> so this is their example, the example of the author. Um, so they're talking about shoes. right? So they're saying, well, OK, if you look at shoes that are in the store, shoes that people wear, um, there's sort of this inverse association between attractiveness and comfort. right? So comfortable shoes tend to be less attractive than uncomfortable shoes. But in fact, there's no reason why shoes can't be both ugly and uncomfortable. Right? You could totally make an ugly and uncomfortable shoe. And clearly, these are all subjective. <laughs> but, um, but in general, right, people are not going to buy ugly, uncomfortable shoes. Right? People generally pick shoes that are either comfortable or attractive or both. Right? So that has really induced this association that, that, that has no causal basis. Right? So if we say, OK, this is our deck, right? So we have comfort, comfort and attractiveness. But we're really only looking at shoes people wear, right? Because manufacturers don't make shoes that, you know, or at least don't make many shoes that people just don't wear. So we have conditioned on, the, on this factor that's downstream. So if um, so, it's a really good article if you want to um, read it. They have a couple other examples. One is um, for celebrities, intelligence and attractiveness. Same sort of thing, right? People um, usually become celebrities because, or uh, maybe actors. I think it's actors, right? So people usually are able to become actors either because you know they're really talented and really smart, or they're really attractive, or both, right? But so you see this sort of inverse association. Um, with a more sort of relevant example. Um, so conditioning on a collider. OK, so this is roughly based on PCSK9 um, variants, which are, um, so PCSK9 is a gene that produces a protein that um, uh, re helps to regulate cholesterol. So there are variants in um, PCSK9 that, reduce, that result in much lower cholesterol. So one of the questions is, is gene R associated with the risk of diabetes? And so should we be adjusting for statin use? Right? So statins are medications that, um, that treat hyperlipidemia, reduce cholesterol, or reduce LDL cholesterol. So people with this gene variant are less likely to get statins because they have naturally low cholesterol. And people with diabetes are more likely to get statins because of their high risk of heart disease. And you know, treatment guidelines recommend um, statins for people with diabetes for most adults with type 2 diabetes. All right, so this is our question. Right? Here's our DAG. We have this gene. We want to know, does it cause diabetes? And we want to know, right? so based on this, right, statin use is a collider, the way I've set, set up this example. So um, to give you some an example, I, I set up a, a little simula like sort of dinky simulation. So I said, OK, this gene has no association with diabetes, right? So the odds ratio is 1, completely null. And we're going to say 5% of people have variant in the gene, and 15% of people have diabetes. And created a population of 100,000 because that gave me some uh, so I didn't wind up with fractional people, <coughs> um, and, and you know basically set up this two by two table. Okay. So if we're not, in this case, we're not conditioning on diabetes, right, and we get an odds ratio of one because I set it up that way. Okay. So 
if we say, okay, among people without diabetes, 0.4% of people with the variant take statins, right? So a very small number because, you know, their cholesterol, LDL cholesterol is naturally low. And 40% of people um, without the, the variant take statins, okay? So that's, this is our um, non-diabetic population. And then in our population with diabetes, um, we say more people with, with diabetes and the variant gene take statins because, they, because of their diabetes. Um, and people compared to the people without diabetes and 70% of people without the variant who, are, who have diabetes take statins. Okay. So then if we stratify in statin use, so okay, so the previous, table of stratifying on diabetes just so that I could get those numbers, like this, those cell numbers. Um, and then I you know, rearranged it so that we are now stratifying on statin use. And um, among the statin users, our odds ratio is 0.95, right? So that's pretty close to one. It's not bad. But among our statin non-users, our odds ratio is almost two. So this makes it look like there is a relationship between this gene and diabetes that um, whoops, is, is entirely related to the fact that we're stratifying on statins, right? Because I, you know, because this was, you know, not real data, I set this up specifically so that there was no association between this gene and diabetes. So this is where, you know, you don't wear automated variable selection procedures and you're just sort of or just throwing variables in a model can really get you in trouble right because if you're adjusting for something that is downstream of your exposure and your outcome you can get really wild results okay so that is so, so that, you know, hopefully that makes colliders a little bit more, sort of get your arms around what happens with colliders a little bit. We also think about conditioning on a variable in the causal path, right? So here, this is, um, you know, this is not a backdoor path, right? This is a direct path. So this is an intermediate, or L is an intermediate here. So are there times when we want to adjust for intermediates? Yeah, sometimes, right? So if we're thinking about mediation analysis, we're, what we're doing is really adjusting for intermediates. We're trying to figure out what, how much of the pathway is through this intermediate and how much of the pathway is, is through some other, or how much of the effect is through some other pathway. Okay, so we do this, we, we adjust for intermediates when we're exploring a causal pathway, right? So we wanna know, not just does A affect Y, but how does A affect Y, right? So how does, how does um, you know, this gene affect this disease? You know, is it through some biomarker? So um, this is a project that I've been working on uh, with Matt Mefford, who's one of the fellows here. Um, so, um, you know, he has been working on a paper looking at these PCSK9 loss of function variants and cognitive impairment, right? So that's that's the direct effect, right? We want to know, um, does PCSK9 loss of function variant uh, lead to cognitive impairment? One of the possible pathways is that PCSK9 variants lead to lower LDL cholesterol, less use of statins, maybe less diabetes. There is some evidence that statins can cause diabetes and that will impact cognitive impairment. So um, reviewer comments, one of the comments we got back was, well, you know, you're not accounting for the bias from statins. So in this case, that statins are not a bias, right? Not, not accounting for the statins because they're in that pathway. Um, so, you know, they're, they're really an intermediate potentially here. Um, and one of the tricks is writing, is arguing with reviewers without telling them they're wrong. Um, and so, you know, sort of saying, 
okay, you know, we're, we ag agree that we're not actually addressing the pathway through which um, statins may be operating. Um, but, you know, it, it really is, in this case, not a bias because it is in the, that pathway. Um, so then, one of the things that can be sort of tricky to distinguish, and I think that this helps a little bit, is, is distinguishing between mediation and moderation or effect modification. Right? So as an epidemiologist, I tend to call this effect modification. In other fields, um, people talk about this as moderation. So in that case, you have a third variable that changes the relationship between your exposure and your outcome. Right? So how does B change the relationship between A and Y? And there's not really a good way to depict this on a formal deck. Right? So, you know, if we want to know, does using a statin modify the association between PCSK9 loss of toxin variants and cognitive impairment? Right? We can draw sort of, you know, one of the, the things that people will tend to do, the sort of natural thing to do, is to draw an arrow between your proposed effect modifier or moderator and this arrow. Which, um, you know, if it helps you to think about it, great. Um, but this isn't really a proper DAG, right? So this is, um, it doesn't have, it doesn't follow all the sort of DAG rules that go along with it. But it, it, you know, sort of says, okay, what we think is maybe statin users, the association between this gene and cognitive impairment might be different between statin users and statin non-users. Right, so I'm racing through this material, I apologize, so um, please, we can, well, but we'll have time for questions. Um, so one of the things that people will sometimes wonder about is, you know, how is, how is this similar or different to a conceptual model, right? So um, conceptual models get used in some fields more than others, so I had no exposure to them actually until I became a faculty member and came here, um, and never even heard of them. Um, but, and there, there are some similarities, right? So both DAGs and conceptual models represent knowledge and assumptions about the way the world works, right? So they're, um, you know, sort of helpful for thinking through um, the design and analysis of the study, right? So both of them kind of have these, have that structure. A lot of conceptual models will also use sort of directed arrows in the way that DAGs do. Um, however, DAGs have formal, formal, formal rules and standards, right? Whereas conceptual models are a lot more flexible, right? So DAGs are always going to have these sort of one unidirectional arrows, or, um, or at least the, the causal DAGs are always going to have these unidirectional. Well, actually, oh, they're directed. So yeah, um, and you know that those those um, have very specific mathematical meaning. Right, so I'm not getting into all the math behind this, but you know, they're, they're, each arrow in a deck means something mathematical. Um, whereas the conceptual models are a lot more flexible, right? So some of them have used arrows, some of them use bidirectional arrows, some of them have like concentric circles, um, and so they're, um, you know, they don't have that same. They're a lot more flexible because they don't have that same direct link to this mathematical representation that the DAGs do. So when I first started looking at these conceptual models, they were kind of making me crazy because I was trying to make them into, um, into math, and they're just not. Um, so, you know, that, that's a major difference. The other major difference is that a lot of times if you're working with a conceptual model, it's not your necessarily conceptual model that you developed, right? It's often a conceptual model that is out there in the literature that, you know, every, or that many people in the field are sort of working on the same conceptual model, right? And are sort of, um, it, it's sort of a shared uh, set of assumptions and, you know, and knowledge about the world, right? So they're often developed, modified over time, but, you know, they're, they're sort of something that's shared across, across projects, across investigators, across groups. Whereas with a DAG, um, you're often developing it specifically for an analysis, right? So you're sort of taking a piece of what might be a larger conceptual model and really sort of zeroing in on your particular research question, right? So you're thinking about my exposure, my outcome, you know, how, how am I going to um, 
uh, effectively adjust for confounding to, to do a study that is not um, that is unbiased and gets this, gets our sort of observed associations as close as possible to the cause and effect relationship. And yes, if I could just say, because I think that's a great distinction, and, and um, I think really successful grants that I've reviewed and seen are really effective at linking a conceptual model with explicit measurement instruments and a DAG. So I think Jerome Allison kind of coined this phrase in its aims page, you know, the following specific aims are grounded in the unifying conceptual model, big picture, big idea, linked to explicit measurement instruments. So I'm taking these global constructs, and here's my measurement, pH, Q9 for depression, whatever else the case may be, and a detailed analytic plan. That. So I think, you know, really successful grants, especially with secondary data, if you could link that model to your measures, to your DAGs, um, and show how it all connects, I think those grants tend to get reviewed really favorably and be, be successful in the health services space. Right, right. So in the health services space, like, I, I definitely got um, slammed with a couple of grant applications because I had my DAGs in there and not my conceptual model, and I think you'll get also, you really need both, right? Okay. You know, whether or not you sort of draw the picture with the DAG or, or the conceptual model, I mean, you really need to have sort of the big picture conceptual model as well as the specifics that would sort of go along with the, the analytic plan. Did you answer to the reviewer um, the second half of that statement? Well, we agree that, you know, staff and leaves it. However, it's part of this pathway. Did, did you did respond in a way that utilize the DAG terminology or, or no way. No, um, you try that. I mean, we, well, we did say causal path. I mean, I think we said, uh, I don't know, that here, well, exactly how we... Because it was more, it was going more to like a clinically focused journal. I mean, not, all, you know, you have to think about the audience that it's going to, and so not everybody's going to understand the concept of the DAG. So, you know, while we're kind of talking about the causal pathway, we're staying a little more clinically um, so that it's understood. Yeah, so that's a, um, you know, what I, you know, I sort of introduce you to the jargon because if you want to sort of pursue this further, um, you sort of need, need that introduction. It's really, um, without without sort of getting a sort of set of definitions, it's really hard to jump into the, the sort of directed acyclic graph literature because there's just, it's all kinds of formal, you know, jargon that have very specific meanings. Um, most of the time, you know, if we're talking to, you know, clinical journals, if we're talking to um, researchers who are not familiar with this, it just, yeah, it just complicates things to, to try and explain it, you know, using this terminology. Sometimes it's really hard. So we had another paper where um, we, so, right, so everybody's pretty, pretty well convinced or uh, most people are pretty well convinced that high LDL cholesterol causes cardiovascular disease, right? Not, not a, in most audiences, that's not a terribly controversial statement. If you look at contemporary data, there is no association between LDL cholesterol and cardiovascular disease, or, or if there is one, it's a very, very weak one. And what has happened is that people are if you look at an observed cholesterol, right, some people are, a lot of people are treated, something like 40% of older U.S. adults are on statins, right? The people who are on statins are on statins because their risk is high, right? So now you have, like, sort of, you have this crazy collider situation going. So you've got bias if you don't adjust for statin use, you've got bias if you do adjust for statin use, and the result of that bias has been that you've essentially flattened out association, right? So trying to explain that in a clinical journal without drawing these pictures would really, really hard. <laughs> um, and I don't know how successful it was. You know, we, so, um, working with someone who was a recent PhD graduate from here, you know, he wrote that paper, and you know, his first explanation had all the diagonal language, and we're like, okay, that's not going to fly in a clinical journal. So then we had to try and explain what was going on in non-technical. Other questions or comments?
So, you know, there is, in epidemiology, there is a sort of train of thought that bags are all there are, um, and this sort of thinking is all there is. Um, so this is really just my, my interpretation. Um, I'm not sure that the math part <laughs> is super is super helpful for most people doing observational research. But I do think that thinking through the logic of it is really helpful. And thinking through, you know, sort of, here, here's the way that I think the world works, here's sort of the variables that I have, you know, here's the unmeasured things and where are those arrows going. Um, and it helps you to identify, you know, which, what things do you need to adjust for to control for confounding or other biases? What things, if you did adjust for them, would actually be inappropriate, right? So the things that are sort of downstream. Or if you're adjusting for a mediator and you're not, you didn't intend to. And to sort of identify the direct and indirect effects, right? So, so sort of helping you think about mediation analysis. So, um, what are they not good for, right? So they're not, at least the formal bag is not particularly helpful for representing effect modification or moderation. Um, you know, you can sort of start drawing arrows into arrows, but those those are not DAGs um, because DAGs have to go into nodes. Um, and they're not really helpful for determining the strength of effects and the magnitude of bias, right? So that's that's that is not represented there, right? So if you've got an unmeasured confounder and the bias is like five percent. Um, that's that's in the confidence interval, right? That you're you never have data that's sort of good enough to really most of the time, you know, five percent up or down for your estimate. You know, as public health people, we generally we better not have that bias, but that's that's not something that we're as concerned about. But if it was like a hundred percent bias, and another thing that I don't have here, right? So it doesn't really give you feedback loops. Um, and that's another another thing, right? It's, expect, it's not like, you know, when you think about how homeostasis works, right? You have these feedback loops. Um, you know, one thing goes up, it, you know, influences something else, and it can, you know, then make that thing go down, right? So your blood sugar goes up, your insulin goes up, your blood sugar goes down. Um, you know, so that um, that is not really in these DAGs. You can. There are ways to sort of step them forward through time, um, but again, that's that, you know that doesn't really take into account the fact that the time scale is for homeostatic sort of things is you know seconds. It's not really um, it's not really you know something you could draw out easily or measure really at the at the time scale that you would need to. I have a question. Yes. Um, so uh, you will see um, in journals uh, um, often uh, when after the analysis are completed, uh, people would um, put their I know coefficients of ratios whatever it is with um, um, level of significance on the arrows to indicate the strength of, of the association or lack of it. Would you consider this a modified DAG or? Um, it depends, right? So not every um, not every drawing with arrows is dead, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you know, yes, you could sort of modify your deck that way. There's no um, the sort of the sort of models underlying the DAGs are are conditional probability models, so they're not. They're, they're Markov models, they're not exactly like those odds ratio kind of estimates, but yeah, I'm not a, I'm not a DAG purist, so I think if you have a DAG and then you want to put those associations there, I think that is totally reasonable. Um, there's another sort of kind of um, school of thought that has linked the DAG language and terminology to structural equation modeling. Um, and there, there's, there's another sort of set of um, conventions um, that I'm less familiar with. So, and, and those, you know, you get the structural equation modeling with the coefficients on the, on the arrows. Uh, 
Other questions, comments? So um, we have we do have plenty of time. I was a little worried about that. Yeah. So kind of practical, kind of pragmatic question. So if someone in the room has got a data set or questions that may be amenable to something like this, so they've got some fixed immutable factor associated with some outcome of interest, and they think there's something in the middle and something that may be colliding and all these you know complex pathways. How would you advise them to get started to interact with things like the bird or otherwise, you know, especially if we don't have experience with this kind of methodology or expertise to go from this is really interesting. I want to draw one of these. I'm kind of clueless. I need help. Um, and just kind of walking through those steps from going from I've got an idea and I think I've got something, but I need help. So I think one of the things that is nice about DAGs is that people, you know, it's something that people will often, you know, just sort of sketch out, even if they're not thinking about, you know, people will sketch out diagrams that look like this, even if they're not thinking about this as a DAG, right? Um, and so I think pretty much like, you know, if you keep in mind that your your arrows mean cause and effect, you know, they, you know, you just sort of start with sketching, right? So how do you think the world works? I think this thing causes that thing, right? Um, and and going from there. Um, in terms of people who are have experience and training in school of thought, there are a ton of them on campus. Um, there are several people in philosophy, philosophy of science, um, who, who do this kind of work. Um, the first class I taught at UAB when I was a brand, brand new assistant professor was um, co-taught with the chair of philosophy, which was really fun. Um, but he's since moved uh, institutions. But but we were teaching, we were talking about this sort of um, logic and, and sort of math. Um, you know, I, I think just you know, one of the nice things about them is that you know, even though the bias, sort of tracing the bias back, it does require um, you know some some of the math part of it um, and, and the logic part, you know, I think you can take this to your, you know, you can draw it out and take it to a, cl a clinical audience and sort of say, does this look like, does this match your expectations? You know, or you can take it to your mentor and say, does this sort of mechanism match the expectations? And then, make sure, you know, okay, how does that, how does that lead to a model? And after doing that, is that the kind of thing where put some thought, something gets out on paper? Would that be an appropriate thing to bring to something like the bird to get consultation and feedback? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just kind of thinking out loud, but as somebody who comes from a field that relies heavily on conceptual models uh, um, or modified DAGs, if, if you will, um, you know, when it comes to the, the, the well, I mean, some sciences, right? Um, when it comes to the assumption making portion, um, at least from the perspective of our field, we usually need to base this on some sort of uh, prior knowledge formulated as a theory. Uh, it, it's really strongly advised against, well, I think that this is associated with this, and I cannot base it on any theoretical uh, knowledge. So I think it's sort of important to maybe stress this out to. Uh, you know, come out of the line of like a empirical, you know, experiences of researchers because we all also biased. Yeah, I mean, we, that's true, right? So you want to base, you don't want to just like, you know, you're not just guessing, right? So you need to have, um, the, you need to have something that you're relying on. Um, so there's actually a really nice paper um, that I, you know. If people are interested in, uh, it's called something like um, causal knowledge is a prerequisite to um, control for confounding, right? And it goes through sort of saying like, okay, here are these associations, you know, and it's just giving you associations between um, variables, and it's it, and then it goes through like, okay, what if it's, what if here's the question, what if here's the question, how you know, and, and how would you change how your analysis works? Um, you know, I think that. For more social science type questions, a lot of times you are relying on theory. Um, but that theory is, or should at least be consistent with empirical observation, right? Um, so, you know, if you're talking about um, sort of 
the more sort of epidemiology side of things, you know, we are we often conflate the two, um, right? So we think, okay, physical activity, you know, health, physical activity is a component of healthy lifestyle, right? So that's you know something that sort of an article of faith, but we sort of treat it, you know, but it's also related. So it's part kind of theory, but it's not really. Uh, stated as such, right? But it's also, you know, very much based on the empirical evidence as well. Can I just, just build on that? Just thinking about, for me, a way that I see applying this, and I'm linking it to theory, is I want to intervene on something to have an outcome of interest. I know a certain group, whatever it is, has disparate outcomes. I know it's not because of that fixed immutable factor, but it's going through some pathway or pathways so the idea of trying to use this approach to say, I know this group has this worst outcome, I can pick through this giant list of things that might be causing it to design my intervention, but can I use this approach in these DAGs to really get a sense for which pathway or pathways are most prominent, most significant, so that my intervention is targeting the thing that I think will give me the biggest return. Like I might focus on this thing over here, but if empirically my data is saying, yeah, with your model and all these things get really complex. Some of these SEM ones are like, oh my gosh, there's just nodes and connections and all these things. Um, but I mean, is that a reasonable way to try to use use this to inform your intervention targets to really maximize what you the effect? Um, yes, but you have to combine it with um, you know knowledge of sort of the magnitude, right? Because sort of DAGs alone don't don't tell you magnitude. Um, but you know, if you're, but yes, you know, it's one of the ways that you can sort of think about, um, you know, that you can think about. Okay, which things can I intervene on, right? So things that are, you, know, you probably want to, if you can, you probably want to intervene, you know, as far upstream as possible. But you know, some of them might be further down. Um, yeah. <coughs> um, I have more of a logistic question, but when you make a DAG. Um, can you have multiple causal pathways in that? Okay, or do you have to make a separate DAG for different? Okay, so you can have multiple possible pathways for how one. Yeah. Um, and so one of the the sort of um, uh, counterintuitive things is that you know you, you can have you can um, if you're thinking about a causal pathway you can write it as you know a arrow with nothing in between, right? So, um, right, so this example, the direct effect, right, that one arrow incorporates sort of the pathway I have below plus any other possible pathway, right? So you can kind of telescope the pathways in and out, um, which is, and, and that changes the interpretation of them, but um, you know, we could have another sort of pleiotropic effect that doesn't go here. Um, and we could split that out, you know, you could have one arrow, or you could, you know, if you're focusing on a bunch of different pathways, you could have a whole bunch of different arrows, and they're representing the same sort of worldview, but just focusing on different pieces of it. So yes, you can absolutely have multiple pathways between your exposure and your outcome. And the interaction between those pathways, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> right. Some of these things, some of these, well, when you see them, like you know, in grants and things, you're like, oh my goodness, and you see. So I'm just, what are your thoughts on that? Like maybe Gabrielle Tews from a social science perspective, because sometimes you see these things, and there are so many pathways and so many parameter estimates that you're just like, this is. I, mean, I understand life is complex, but this is really complex. <laughs> Trying to think scientifically about doing something. So is, is there some is there some parsimony? I mean, in terms of thinking about this, where you want to be comprehensive, but you also want to be somewhat. I mean, I concise. Like when I. It's, I mean, for me, it's kind of a product of what's your, what's the main thing you want to look at with the data that you have, what, like, what variables you can, like, realistically incorporate, and then you have to think that, you know, 
certain factors may may account for a lot of other things as well. So like age is a big factor that may account for a lot of other variables that you want to measure or you want to add in your models. And so that the parsimony kind of comes in thinking about, okay, what could really be a marker for other things that you're you're kind of interested in? So you could say, well, this is kind of a proxy for this measure. And it sounds like you're grouping your demographic variables into a box or something. Can you and like the demographic, clinical characteristics, social, mm -hmm. specific number. Yeah. So you can you can um, you know because the more sort of arrows and nodes you have on these, the less um, readily interpretable they are. A lot of times we will just sort of say, okay, rather than having a node represent a single variable, it's going to represent all the demographic information we have, right? And so that's sort of like thinking about your nodes rather representing a variable, representing an array of variables. Um, and that is one way to sort of, it doesn't necessarily simplify the, the conceptual um, complexity, but it can help simplify the um, like visual complexity. Um, in terms of when you've got intermediates and you have pathways interacting with each other, that is a very tricky, I mean, that's a, you know, just conceptually that's very tricky. Mathematically, it's extremely tricky. And a lot of, um, a lot of the standard approaches have been shown to be biased. Um, and so um, how badly they're biased, I think, is not entirely clear. You know, it probably depends on the question. Um, there is, it's an active area of research for people doing this kind of work. Um, and honestly, it, I have to like sit in a quiet room when I'm reading those papers because they're very complicated. Because you have, because you have to think about like, okay, if I'm looking at this pathway that interacts with this other pathway, am I saying that I'm holding that other pathway constant, or am I going to allow that interaction when I think about the estimate? Um, and so there's these um, manipulated to controlled and uncontrolled natural effects, and it, it's and so maybe a takeaway for for me is just because. I think about a lot of the work in looking around the room where I'm looking at, you know, stigma or intersectional stigmas and depression and coping and resilience and all of those things are interrelated. I mean, there's, you know, they're not interrelated, but maybe in terms of the initial approach, keeping it fairly simple and, and not try to mathematically account for between my independent variable, these four intermediary variables and the outcome, I'm not going to worry about trying to get all the intricacies of the complex because it's mathematically too challenging or no I mean I think I think you you should go as mathematically challenging as your as your question warrants right so if, the, if that's what you want to do then I think then then you start going down that path but, you know that's something that's, that's scientifically important this is a question you're really going for you know I'm, I'm certainly not a proponent of not doing not addressing questions because they're hard um, you know I think that if they're making crazy complex that you get after Yep. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, Tyler Vanderbilt writes a lot of, uh, of those um, papers and sort of thinking about how do you how do you think about pathways that are potentially interacting with each other. I think for a lot of the folks in the room that knowing their research, I think that's going to be a somewhat common phenomenon. I mean, where you do have these intermediary pathways that, to some extent, do interact with one another towards some ultimate. Mm -hmm. And so if you're sort of working in the structural equation modeling um, framework, there is a book, I think by Shipley, it's called something like um, Cause and Correlation in Biology, that really addresses, so um, addresses the, the sort of structural equation modeling pathway related to this. Um, it's a really good book. Um, it's most of the examples, it's been a while since I read it, but a lot of the examples related to sheep, but I think that it also... <laughs> So, yeah, it was like, oh, that's sheep farming, and, and uh, there's a lot of examples. But I think that it is more, you know, the structure of the problems are, are in some ways similar. And also where you're sort of getting these indirect sort of um, latent variable models. Yeah. Um, so this is probably a bad question, because I got hung up on your example of why not to, where you can get tripped up with, um, say, diabetes and pedigree. How limiting do you think the not being able to have double-headed arrows is in your thinking? Because I was thinking, like, I was trying to sort of draw that out, and I'm thinking, especially when we have studies where there are interventions that we want to consider, 
Mm -hmm. Those almost always go two ways. Your LDL influences whether you get statins, and your statins definitely influence your LDL. Right. So um, for that scenario, I don't think it's actually too bad because what you can do is you can step it through time. And I actually took the slides out because I was worried I was going to get um, I was going to go over time. But what you can do is you can say, okay, so you know, say I show up to the doctor, the doctor takes my you know, measures my LDL cholesterol, um, and then they make a decision about whether or not I should go on a statin, right? And so maybe they put me on a low dose statin. And then, and this is, and, and then, you know, the next time I go to the doctor, my next LDL cholesterol measurement determines whether or not maybe I get up titrated, right? So you can, um, in that case, you can step it through time and you can draw those arrows. So, so you would essentially treat LDL cholesterol at baseline different than the LDL cholesterol. Well, those are different variables. And so you can, you can draw those out. Um, and it works. That approach works when you have sort of discrete or reasonably discrete time frames. So there it's, it's actually not a problem. And that has led to, if you've heard about marginal structural models, um, which is an approach to deal with that, that, that um, approach was developed specifically to deal with that fact that you've got these sort of iterative over time treatment decisions. Um, so I don't think that, so that's okay. Where it gets messy is, so I saw a proposal where they were going to essentially use this to deal with metabolomics, right? And metabolomics just don't work in that kind of step. You know, it's not like a unidirectional arrow. And if you've got one measure of metabolomics, you know, it's not, you, you don't get all of that um, sort of, you don't, it doesn't incorporate that feedback loop. Whereas the feedback loop for treatment decisions happens slowly enough that you can sort of say, okay, time one, time two, time three, time four, right? And those are maybe visits that are spaced a couple months apart. So you really want to think about these things as, as though they were unfolding over a relatively slow period of time. And if you know the feedback loop is not sort of instantaneous, you sort of step that through and trying to make that double-headed arrow and sort of sloppy thinking and conflating all of your LDL values. Yeah. Yeah. Then is it the north? Someone sponsors, I feel like, an annual causal inference workshop. On campus, I'm just thinking folks are interested. Like, I think that, that might be another place to kind of seek out. I believe it's every yeah. year that they have causal um, Bruce methods workshop. The causal, yeah, it's like causal thinking in uh, obesity research. Um, so one of the things that um, kind of makes me a little crazy um, is that this is called causal inference, but and these, you know, the sort of models that come out of it are called causal models. But in fact, any model that meets where the assumption is, all the assumptions are met are causal. You know, um, so these assumptions might, um, these assumptions in some cases are better. The obesity workshop is not, let's see, I'm trying to think of if they do any of this kind. I'm not sure that they do this kind of reasoning, though it is helpful. You know, they do it, it's a sort of different way of thinking about causa of causality. So they're certainly not, this is not the only way of thinking about cause and effect by any means. This is one sort of model. Um, and it, it is helpful. I mean, I think it is an interesting, interesting way of thinking about, like, how do we, how do, we do better with observational research with the that Mark Center? If I want to add a lifestyle uh, um, for, the, for the possible pathway, so how can I add, add like, for example, physical activity for the LDC uh -huh. or diabetes or cognitive impairment? Or right. So in this particular case, right, the species K9 loss of function variant has very little. Um, as far as, as best we can tell, um, it doesn't have much effect on physical activity, say, or any other healthy lifestyle factors. Um, and healthy lifestyle factors are not going to impact your um, your exposure, right? Yes. Because this is a genetic genetically based exposure. It could physical activity could be here, and it could be impact. You could have arrows going into each one of those variables on this pathway. Um, so, you know, if, if physical activity is your question, then absolutely it needs to be here, and PCSK9 variant frankly doesn't. But um, it doesn't, but if your question is about the loss of function variant, that's sort of where the DAGs come in. 
because physical activity is going to be sort of, in, and all the other healthy lifestyle factors are going to be pretty much independent of your genetic makeup, then you can sort of think about, do I need to consider that in my, in my analysis, in my thinking about the scientific question? Does that mean? Yes. Or can I choose a separate one? One is for the physical active one, one is the non-active one. Right, right. And sort of that's one of the, I think that's one of the differences when you think about a conceptual model versus, you know, a DAG is the DAG, you know, you can get rid of extreme like things that are not specifically relevant to your research question, whereas the conceptual models tend to be more broad and want sort of all those all the factors. More of a curiosity question, because your love is on a cliffhanger. What was the result of your Cirque du Soleil study? <laughs> um, so, it was, so it was equivocal, right? So what we found was that um, time off seemed to be related to, to an increased risk of minor injuries, no association with major injuries. So um, the interpretation was that um, people would sort of like, oh, I have this twinge in my knee, right? Because these injuries are being collected by um, people visiting the trainer, or or by having like having to have medical attention, right? Um, so it was not associated with injuries that required medical attention, like you know something beyond uh, you know having a trainer or physical therapist who work with all the who tour with the companies, um, and so. Interpretation was that people were like, oh, you have this twinge in my knee, and then, you know, I have a day off, and so I'll just see if that goes away, and if it doesn't go away, then I visit the trainer. And we talked to some of the, and so this is why, um, it's, you know, you don't want to just rely on the numbers, so we talked to some of the circus performers, and that was pretty much, they confirmed that that was what was going on, was that, because um, we saw this big increase in, in minor injuries, and now increase in major injuries. Which would be that you would think the timing aspects would potentially result in major injuries. And we also looked at effect modification by role, right? Because that's, you know, the timing, thinking about, I can't remember how it, it was eventually like anybody who had a thing where um, uh, missed timing could impact injury. So, you know, if you were, if you were like flying through the air and were being caught or the catcher of people flying through the air, that's sort of so actually, that's interesting. That's something I was thinking about was because the the DAG would lead you to not think about role as you went through. Whereas I can think, you know, someone say is supporting a human pyramid. You can imagine it's very stressful, and doing that day after day might make you more likely to strain something. Whereas if it's something intricate and movement oriented, you could lose timing. So mm -hmm. it's, it's like one of those things where I was worried that the DAG might make you not consider something that was important. Yes, and so the the Markov models behind this essentially standardize over, you know. So if you're if you're using the full on like Markov model G computation stuff that goes along with the the DAGs, um, what it does is it basically says, okay, I'm just gonna you know do a weighted average over those, and so yeah, I think that's a problem, um, and that's why you know when I was thinking about sort of where is this not useful? If you have issues where there is effect modification, I don't find this problem. Yeah, and I guess what there is, the issue is, you're thinking about a population, and if you're thinking the whole Cirque du Soleil and make a DAG for that, it's probably going to be different than if you say, let's talk about contortionists mm -hmm. or trapeze artists. Right. Right. So we wound up, and we wound up in, you know, <coughs> doing both, essentially. We're sort of looking at the whole population, then we're looking at you know, different types of outcomes, and then, you know, sort of thinking about, okay, maybe it's different for contortionists versus, um, you know, the acrobats versus the musicians and the clowns. I'm going to have another comment also, I'm just thinking back to my field. It seems that we have an issue um, with our terminology because um, um, I have seen um, both uses um, of what I call conceptual model where it's very comprehensive and it's very broad and could be applied to a wide range of studies. And also we have the version that's very, very specific to the specific analysis. And it's also called a conceptual model. So you couldn't really say that conceptual models are broad in general as opposed to, you know, specific because 
um, from, you know, in my field, they seem to fit both purposes. So um, can you comment on that? Um, that's why I have, I sort of hedged and said often. Um, so, you know, <laughs> my, uh, so, you know, my exposure to conceptual models is, was honestly, frankly, pretty grudging at the beginning because I wanted to do DAGs. Um, but, uh, so the ones that I have worked with and I'm most familiar with do tend to be sort of big picture conceptual models, but I'm, but I'm aware that there are different kinds of conceptual models that get used in different contexts. Um, you know, I don't think it's necessarily wrong or bad. It's just sort of thinking about, you know, sort of what's the scope of what you're looking at. And the DAGs tend to be, you know, just because they get to get all the arrows right and have everything there, once you get more than like 10 variables on there, it, they're just impossible. They're just spaghetti. And you've got to sort of switch to the mathematical representation. So yeah, I'm not going to criticize your terminology. <laughs> <laughs> well, but sometimes people work uh, use the word framework, conceptual framework as opposed to conceptual model. And um, honestly, I have not seen uh, a, uh, a uh, convincing, you know, definition either way. It seems to be an arbitrary what people use. Yeah, and I think you know one of the things that, that is hard is that a lot of the science, you know, a lot of the fields that we're working in are relatively new, right? So even within epidemiology, different books and different authors will call the same thing different names, and we'll call use the same names for different things. So you know, we, um, which is really frustrating, but I think thinking through like what is it, trying to get at the concept rather and sort of trying to make, I've given up on trying to make the terms consistent. I think we've got to wrap up the yep. next meeting. Emily, thank you so much. This is oh. always an amazing call. Thank you. Yeah, this is, I always have fun. So, and I'm willing, I can stick around for a bit if you need to. I think we'll plan a sociology and epidemiology debate. We'll have you and Gabriella at a future session. <laughs> <laughs> Point counterpoint. Oh, I'm not. Yeah, I don't think sociology is wrong. I'm joking. <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah, I'll go see how the beauty of what we do, right? And I'll go see how the beauty of what we do.